I was taken aback by the disrespectful remarks Nikki, my wife of seven years, had just hurled at me. In just a few moments, I realized how little regard she had for me. Here we were, at a mountain resort attending a four-day bachelorette celebration for her older sister, Kirsten, who was preparing to tie the knot for the third time. I couldn't help but wonder how she managed to sway her current fiancé. Was it her wealth, or did she threaten legal action? Being a lawyer, I assumed she had him sign an ironclad prenuptial agreement, likely under some form of intense pressure. The day before, on Wednesday, we decided to enjoy one of the public hot tubs available at the resort. Earlier that day, Kirsten had warned us about the possibility of encountering nude men in the hot tubs. I thought she was joking, but she wasn't. Apparently, the hot tubs here allowed nudity. Once we were in the water, I noticed five men across from us who seemed to be naked. My observation was confirmed when they got out of the tub, dried off, and lounged in their chairs, unconcerned about their exposure. However, one man, a tall and muscular individual with long hair tied back, lay on the grass next to the hot tub, one leg raised, revealing what appeared to be a sizable member. Nikki's gaze was fixated on him, her expression distant. Perhaps I should provide some background. My name is Ned Carson, and my wife is Nikki. I'm 39 years old, while she just turned 32. I used to work as a police officer until I was injured in the line of duty, sustaining multiple gunshot wounds. Following my medical discharge, Nikki, who was one of the physical therapists aiding in my rehabilitation, helped me regain my mobility. Though I still face challenges with walking long distances, I manage. After leaving the force, I became a private investigator. Fortunately, most of my work involves desk duties or surveillance from my car, minimizing physical strain. I partnered with a seasoned investigator for several years until his passing, after which I assumed control of our agency with the approval of his partner. Nikki and I dated, fell in love, and eventually tied the knot. Initially, our marriage was fulfilling, or so I believed. However, a couple of years ago, I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and high cholesterol. My heavy smoking habit only exacerbated my health issues. Despite efforts to quit smoking, I found myself struggling to perform sexually, likely due to the medications I was taking for my conditions. Initially, Nikki appeared understanding, and we made do with what we had. Even though my erectile dysfunction limited our intimacy, I made sure to pleasure her orally, ensuring she reached orgasm. However, something shifted over the past couple of years. Nikki transformed from a loving, caring partner into a demanding and short-tempered individual, often criticizing me and showing dissatisfaction with my efforts. Our sexual life dwindled, and it felt like nothing I did could please her anymore. Hoping to reignite our connection, I thought this mountain resort getaway might help. Yet, as I observed Nikki's interaction with the man shamelessly exposing himself, a sense of familiarity dawned on me, though I couldn't quite place him. Earlier that day, Nikki mentioned going shopping with her sister, so I decided to play some golf. Returning sooner than expected, I found Nikki back in our room, her hair wet and her demeanor changed. She revealed spending time at the hot tub, encountering a man named Ramon Torres, who works with a movie studio on the West Coast. Suddenly, it clicked. Torres was associated with less reputable work, not mainstream films. Realizing Nikki's intentions, I confronted her. She admitted to seeking physical satisfaction elsewhere, expressing frustration with my condition and lifestyle choices. Her words felt like a blow to the gut. I couldn't comprehend the woman before me. She demanded someone assertive and virile, contrasting with my current state as a desk-bound, impotent partner. Feeling stunned and betrayed, I questioned if this was all a terrible dream. But Nikki wasn't finished with her revelations. Do you know what he did? She asked with a sneer. He ordered me to strip naked right there in front of everyone. And did you? I asked. Of course, I did, she replied. And did you have sex with them too? I inquired, although I already knew the answer. She chuckled as she tossed off her robe, revealing her nude form. I noticed the bruises and marks on her, saw her swollen, red genitals with semen trickling down. Have sex, she scoffed. No. I fucked them. Every single one of them. I sucked their huge cocks and swallowed their cum. 
I licked their assholes and took their balls in my mouth. I let them all fuck me in the ass. I even had three of them at once. And yes, I let them all ejaculate inside me. Why don't you come here and clean their come out of me? You'd enjoy that, wouldn't you? And you know what else? No, I replied quietly, trying to control my anger. What? They're all on their way here right now, and they're going to have their way with me right here in this bed while you watch, she announced. I stood up and walked to the closet, grabbing my suitcase. What are you doing? she asked. Are you running away like a coward? I took a deep breath before responding, counting to ten. Suddenly, it clicked. Ramon had a history of exploiting women, getting them addicted to sex and drugs before coercing them into doing pornography. When he was done with them, he discarded them onto the streets, where they struggled as prostitutes, trading sex for their next fix. Despite numerous attempts by Vice, they couldn't bring him down. If you were wise, you'd leave too, I remarked. But you're not wise, are you? Stay and enjoy your fling if you wish, but regardless, we're through. Send my regards to your sister. I finished packing and headed for the door. What, are you just abandoning me? She sneered. Yes, I am, I affirmed. I've had enough of your nonsense. And I refuse to be your compliant cuckold. Farewell. With that, I turned and left. As I walked down the hallway, I spotted Ramon and his companions approaching. After they passed by, I called out to him. Ramon, I called. He turned to face me. Yeah, what do you want? He asked. I removed my wedding ring and tossed it to him. You want her? She's yours, I stated when he caught it. I'm done with her. He smirked and pocketed the ring. Whatever, dude, he said. He snorted and continued on his way. I proceeded to the car, loaded up, and drove off, stopping to purchase cigarettes and beer. At that moment, I didn't care if I lived or died, I just needed to vent. Three hours later, I was home. I had hoped Nikki would at least apologize, but she didn't. To hell with her, I thought to myself. Since it was still early, I decided to take action. If Nikki thought she could have her little orgy and return home as if nothing happened, she was mistaken. I called a locksmith and arranged to have all the locks on the house changed. It cost extra for the late service, but it was worth it to me. I grabbed a beer and settled onto my back porch with a notepad, jotting down a list of tasks. Having worked on enough cases involving infidelity, I understood the typical outcomes. The husband usually got the short end of the stick while the wife walked away with half of everything. However, given that we lived in a no-fault state, filing for divorce on grounds of adultery wasn't an option. After making my list, I indulged in a couple more beers and a few cigarettes. Eventually, I retired to bed, hoping against hope that I'd awaken to find it was all just a dreadful dream. Alas, no such luck. The following morning, I checked my phone, desperately wishing for some sign of reason from Nikki. But there was nothing, no calls, no texts. Downing a cup of coffee, I rang up Nick Parsons, a key lawyer we frequently worked with. After recounting the situation, he assured me he'd prepare the divorce papers. We agreed to serve her at her workplace on Monday for maximum impact. You know the drill, Ned, Nick cautioned. Don't do anything rash. You know me, Nick, I replied. Yeah, I do, and that's precisely why I'm telling you to keep a level head, he emphasized. Talk to your boss, see if he can arrange surveillance on your wife and this Ramon character. I want you as far from this mess as possible. Got it, I affirmed. Ending the call, I dialed my boss, Paul Drake. Hey, Ned, weren't you and your wife off on a mountain getaway? He greeted. What's up? Everything okay? Not at all, Paul, I sighed, proceeding to share my ordeal. Damn, he muttered sympathetically. I'll get someone up there to keep an eye on things, but it needs to be someone Nikki doesn't recognize. Thanks, Paul, I really appreciate it, I expressed as we wrapped up the conversation. Next stop, the bank to handle our accounts. I withdrew half and canceled her credit card, contemplating canceling her ATM card but opting to reduce its daily withdrawal limit instead. Then, I opened a solo account at another bank. 
After devouring a pastrami sandwich at a diner, I returned home. With little else to do, I decided it was time for some introspection. Stepping onto the bathroom scale, I noted my weight, 215 pounds. Glancing at my reflection in the mirror, I saw a full head of hair but also a burgeoning gut and flabby muscles where once there were firm ones. No wonder Nikki had lost interest in me. Heck, I wasn't too keen on myself in this state either. I recalled the doctor's advice about managing my diabetes by maintaining a weight below 200 pounds. Despite receiving a dietary guide, I had brushed it off, thinking I was too young to worry about such matters. Now, I reconsidered. Perhaps Nikki had a point, I had neglected my health. Yet, her actions were unjustifiable. If she truly cared for me, she would have addressed it sooner. Determined to make a change, I grabbed the phone book and my pack of cigarettes, heading to the back porch to search for gems. After finding a couple of options, I prepared to leave when my phone rang. Though the number was unfamiliar, I answered. Ned speaking, I greeted, recognizing Kirsten's voice at the other end. Ned, where are you? she inquired. Nikki mentioned you left last night. Yeah, I did, I confirmed. Why? We were just wondering what happened, she explained. Nikki seems worse for wear. I've never seen her like this. She mentioned you had a disagreement and left. Care to elaborate? Maybe Nikki should explain, I replied. Is everything okay between you two? Kirsten pressed. Not really, I admitted. By the way, were you aware that Ramon Torres and his crew are at the resort? Of course, she responded. They're handling the entertainment for our bachelorette party. I even arranged for a camera crew. Why do you ask? Just curious, I deflected. Did Nikki know about his line of work? Yes, I informed her, Kirsten confirmed. I was surprised to see you there. It was meant to be a girls' event, but I figured if you two were into that lifestyle, it wasn't my concern. So, you were aware she intended to involve me in this cuckold scenario? I clarified. Yes, we all knew, she acknowledged. I thought, to each their own. Is there a problem? Nothing I can't handle, I assured, keeping my cards close. Should I have Nikki reach out to you? Kirsten offered. Not necessary, I declined. Okay, she said. Just let her have her fun, all right? She'll come back to you when it's over. It's just sex, after all. No, it's not. I disagreed firmly. It was a calculated betrayal. And you played a part in it. Please, don't be melodramatic, Kirsten retorted. It's just a weekend. You'll come to pick her up on Sunday, won't you? No, I replied firmly. She can find her own way back, but she's not welcome. Despite hearing Kirsten gasp, I remained resolute. Goodbye, Kirsten, I concluded, ending the call. I was seething with anger and frustration. Nikki's premeditated betrayal left me feeling utterly betrayed and humiliated. The urge to punch a hole in the wall surged within me. Instead of succumbing to destructive impulses, I headed to a gym. With each punch to the bag, I vented my frustration, imagining it was Nikki and Ramon. After exhausting my arms, I took a shower. You okay, Mac? A trainer asked as I dressed. Taking a moment, I decided to open up to him. He listened attentively as I recounted the ordeal. I'm sorry to hear that, Ned, he sympathized. Please, call me Ned, I interjected. Okay, Ned, he acquiesced. It sounds like you need more than just physical training. Would you consider talking to a counselor? Realizing he was right, I accepted the suggestion. He handed me a card for Rose Carlson, a counselor. Give her a call, he advised. She's excellent, especially in situations like yours. Yeah, I'll do that, I agreed. In the meantime, I noticed you favor your right leg, he observed. Upon learning about my injuries, he offered assistance. I can help you with that, he offered. We also have specialists for diabetes. Are you willing to commit to a long-term program? After deliberating, I nodded in agreement. Good, he affirmed. 
Let's get you signed up. As we proceeded, he introduced me to his colleagues, who expressed gratitude for my past service. Leaving the gym, I felt a newfound sense of appreciation. Upon returning home, I promptly scheduled an appointment with Rose for the following Tuesday. I held onto a sliver of hope that Nikki might reach out, but as the weekend wore on, silence prevailed. Paul called to reassure me that they had someone monitoring Nikki's movements at the resort. I expressed my gratitude and informed him of my counseling appointment. Glad to see you're taking positive steps, Ned, he remarked. Take all the time you need. I'll keep you updated once we have more information. Got it, I affirmed, hanging up. Attempting to unwind proved futile. While a part of me craved numbing my emotions with alcohol, reason prevailed. The weekend dragged on painfully until Paul's call on Sunday morning. He confirmed Nikki's departure with Ramon. They left around 9 a.m., Paul reported. We've got it all on tape. I'll get you a copy. Any idea where they're headed? I inquired. Not a clue, Paul admitted. Stay in touch. Let me know if she turns up. I will, I assured him before attempting to reach Nikki, but to no avail. After leaving a voicemail, I called Kirsten. Nikki left with Ramon this morning, Kirsten confirmed. Do you know where they're headed? I pressed. No clue, she replied dismissively. It's her choice. Feeling abandoned, I waited at home, every minute dragging like an eternity. Noon came and went with no sign of Nikki. An hour stretched into several, her absence gnawing at me. Frustrated, I attempted to track her phone, only to find it switched off. Scouring my email yielded no answers. Hours crept by, and by 6 p.m., anxiety gripped me. Paul's inquiries yielded no trace of Nikki. Whether she chose not to return or encountered trouble, I was left in the dark. I had a hunch and turned to my computer. Checking our account online, I noticed a $200 withdrawal from an airport near the resort around 9.45 a.m. That was the daily limit I'd set on Friday. Based on this, I speculated she flew off with Ramon and his crew. But to where? I searched for flights from that airport and found departures to Los Angeles, Miami, San Francisco, Dallas, and Seattle around the same time. Knowing Ramon's West Coast base, I leaned towards Los Angeles, yet uncertainty lingered until her next card use. I briefed Paul. We'll have to wait for her to use the card again, he remarked. That won't be until tomorrow at the earliest, I noted. And she could be anywhere by then. Have you thought about reporting her missing? He suggested. The police won't act until she's gone for 24 hours, I explained. Then all we can do is wait, he conceded. Is there any hint in the video transcripts about her destination? I inquired. We might find something if we scour through it, he replied. Want to give it a shot? I have to try something, I insisted. We need to know where she's headed, if at all. Come over, and we'll dig into it, he offered. I rushed to his place, where Donna greeted me. Can I get you something to drink, Ned, she asked. Coffee, please, I requested, needing to stay alert. In Paul's office, he handed me a stack of papers. See what you can find, he directed. As I delved in, the contents turned my stomach. Most of it was Nikki's explicit desires and Ramon's crude remarks about her. Amongst it was disparaging comments about me from Nikki and her companions. Your husband's a coward, Ramon taunted. He's history, Nikki sneered. He handed over his ring, declaring you've got me now. The laughter echoed through the transcripts, mocking me. I might as well urinate on it for old time's sake, she remarked, followed by laughter. In that moment, I questioned what I had ever seen in her. Goodbye and good riddance, I thought, as we continued scouring the transcripts for any clue. Suddenly, Paul exclaimed. Wait, he interjected. I think I found something. What is it? I inquired. Late Saturday night, around 11.45 p.m., he specified. Here, take a look at this. He handed me the transcript, directing me to a section to read for context. This pussy's top-notch, boss, one of Ramon's associates complimented. 
We could profit big from this. You think so? Ramon queried. Definitely, another chimed in. What about her? Ramon prodded. Interested in making some serious money with this fine lady? I'm not some streetwalker, Nikki retorted, sparking laughter. No, babe, I'm talking films, online content, Ramon elaborated. You've got the looks and the body. Just do what you're doing now in front of the camera. You're a natural. I'm planning a new line of cuckolding and humiliation videos, and you'd be perfect. Yeah? When can I start? Nikki inquired. We can leave right after this party, Ramon suggested. I'll set you up in L.A., and you'll work exclusively for me. Sure, I get a cut, but you could earn big with enough videos. Can I have more of that powder and some ecstasy? Nikki asked. And some more of that white stuff? Anything you want, he assured. So, I get to have sex, do drugs, and get paid, she clarified. And I get to humiliate losers like Ned? Exactly, Ramon confirmed. I'm in, Nikki declared. What about your husband? One of the associates questioned. Will you tell him? Forget him, he's done, she dismissed. He won't ever see me again. When do we leave? Tomorrow morning, Ramon scheduled. We'll leave at 9 a.m., head to the airport, and fly out west. Damn right, Nikki agreed. Let's do it. Handing back the transcript, I inquired, do we have this on video? Yeah, let me find the disc and cue it up, Paul replied. He inserted the disc, fast-forwarded to the mention time, and glanced at me. Ready? he asked. Let's get it done, I replied. As the video played, I witnessed the scene unfold through the window of our room, Nikki, naked on the bed beside Ramon and his crew, a camera in one's hand, and a tray with lines of cocaine nearby. I could sense that she was under the influence of something, probably cocaine. I scanned the video for any other familiar faces, but found none. It wouldn't have surprised me if Nikki's sister was involved in this mess too. As we watched, following the transcript, they resumed their activities, with Nikki engaging in sexual acts with multiple men. That's enough, I declared, repulsed. Turn it off. Paul complied, looking at me expectantly. So, what's the plan? He inquired. It's clear she's doing this willingly, even under the influence. Kidnapping is out of the question, I concluded. And Kirsten's absence in the video suggests she likely isn't aware. But we still need to make a genuine effort to locate Nikki for the legal proceedings. Do you have any contacts in L.A.? You know I've got connections everywhere, Paul reassured. I'll reach out and see what we can find. Keep me informed once you locate her, I requested. I want to be the one to serve her the papers. No chance, Ned, Paul insisted. I know you're hurting, but I can't let you get deeper into this. I know you too well. You'd do something rash, and I'd have to bail you out. Stay put. Let Nick and me handle this. I'm serious. I'll have your license revoked if you try anything. Fine, fine, I relented, raising my hands. I'll behave, I promise. You better, Paul warned. Let me make some calls, then I'll loop in Nick. Don't worry, I'll keep you updated. Now, go home, relax, have a beer. Watch TV. Better yet, take a few days off. I can't do that, I objected. I have responsibilities. I'll take care of it, Paul insisted. Consider it in order. You're on vacation, starting now. Okay, I acquiesced. I'm on vacation. I'll head home and be a good boy. We shook hands, and I left, thanking Donna for the coffee. I briefly considered a beer but decided against it, driving straight home. It was fortunate, as the house phone rang the moment I stepped into the living room. Hello? I answered. Seeing Kirsten's number, I activated the call recording feature. Hi Ned, it's Kirsten, she greeted. Yes, I know, I responded. And just to let you know, I'm recording this call. Hope you don't mind. Not at all, she replied. If I were you, I'd probably do the same. 
What do you want, Kirsten? I inquired. Nikki reached out to me, she explained. She's asked me to represent her in case you file for divorce. Do you know where she is? I pressed. She says she's in Miami right now, but will be moving around and won't be back anytime soon, Kirsten relayed. Miami, huh? I remarked skeptically, suspecting she was either misled or lying. That's what she said, Kirsten confirmed. She believes you'll file for divorce. Is that true? Papers are in the works as we speak, I informed her. Once they're ready, send them to me, she requested. I'll email you my address. I'll pass that along, I replied. Did you have any inkling she planned to leave me to join Ramon Torres's adult film industry? No, Ned, I had no idea, she admitted. I may not be your biggest fan, but I'm telling you the truth. I thought she was just trying to provoke a reaction from you by sleeping with him, not abandoning you. It shocked me when she revealed her intentions. I know you're fundamentally decent, Ned, so please accept my apologies. Were you aware of the drugs he gave her? I queried. The cocaine and ecstasy? I knew about the ecstasy, but not the cocaine, she clarified. We all took some ecstasy that night, but I didn't see any cocaine. Are you familiar with his treatment of the women he recruits? I pressed. He produces adult films, she explained. Specializing in gangbangs, cuckolding, and humiliation. He aimed to start a new series featuring older amateur women like Nikki. But I had no idea he targeted her. You're avoiding my question, Kirsten, I insisted. Do you know what he does to them? I'm not sure what you mean, she feigned ignorance. Don't play innocent, I retorted. He exploits them, ruins them, then discards them, leaving them to fend for themselves in prostitution to sustain their habits. That's what awaits your sister. How long do you think she'll last? Is this genuine concern? She challenged. Don't be absurd, I scoffed. As angry as I am with her, I wouldn't wish that fate on anyone. Not even you. Where's your concern for your sister? I'll take her in before that happens, she asserted defensively. Make sure she knows that, I warned. From what I gather about him, he'll discard her within five years. Maybe sooner. I hope you have room for her. You needn't worry about my accommodations, she snapped. I only care about your divorce terms. You'll find out soon, I assured her. Very well, she conceded. Do you have a message for Nikki? No, I replied curtly. I have nothing to say to her right now. Then I suppose we're done here, Ned, she concluded. Once again, I'm sorry. Have your attorney send the papers directly to me? All communication will be through us. Goodbye, Ned. We ended the call, and I ceased the recording. I briefed Nick on our conversation. Her own sister representing her, huh? After aiding her actions, he remarked. Impressive. Is that even ethical? I inquired. Not technically, but it's not uncommon, Nick explained. However, it does raise some eyebrows. We'll send Kirsten a copy, but I want to try serving your wife personally. I don't trust Kirsten to ensure she receives them. Do you think she'd really do that? I questioned. Absolutely, Nick confirmed. You'd be surprised what she's capable of. I'll discuss with Paul, see if we can locate Nikki. If not, we'll resort to a divorce by publication. What's that? I queried. When a spouse goes missing, we can publish the document in a newspaper where she's likely to see it weekly for four weeks, he explained. If she's in L.A., we'll run it there and locally to cover our bases for the court. That's on top of sending it to Kirsten, correct? I confirmed. Absolutely. Just sending it to her doesn't guarantee Nikki served, Nick clarified. After discussing further, we wrapped up the call. I grabbed a meal, had a smoke, then hit the hay. Over the following weeks, we tracked Nikki's ATM usage and pinpointed her likely location in Long Beach, California. Paul's L.A. contact reported sightings in local clubs where she performed, but her residence remained elusive. Nikki's supervisor, 
Pat Silva, called, concerned about her absence from work. I calmly informed her of Nikki's career switch. A porn star? Really? Pat exclaimed. Yes, pursuing her dream, I confirmed. In Southern California. So she won't be back? Pat inquired. I doubt it, I replied. I'll process her final pay, Pat said. Where should I send it? Just mail it here for now, I instructed. I'll pass it to her attorney. All right, Ned, she sighed. We'll miss her. Thanks, Pat, I said, ending the call. I forwarded Nikki's pay to Kirsten, as promised, without much concern for its delivery. My sessions with Dr. Carlson, a.k.a. Rose, proved beneficial. She listened without judgment, helping me regain confidence. With John's aid at the gym, I shed a few pounds and adopted a sustainable diet, glimpsing my former self in the mirror. Nick's work progressed too. After drafting the divorce petition and publishing it locally and in the L.A. Times, he sent a courtesy copy to Kirsten, who was displeased. She demanded a meeting with us. What's with this? She demanded. This isn't a divorce petition, it's an affront. Who gives you the right to demand a 75 to 25 split with no support? The real affront is what your client did, with your assistance. Since she abandoned the marriage, this is our response, Nick defended. She hasn't even retrieved her belongings from my client's home. My client hasn't received the papers yet, Kirsten snapped. That's because she's been hiding in L.A., Nick retorted. Since we lack her address and you've been uncooperative, we pursued a divorce by publication. The fourth notice just went out in both local and L.A. papers. I'll fight this, she snarled. Suit yourself, Nick shrugged. And fight she did, with motions that went nowhere and demands for counseling, reluctantly ordered by the judge. I was surprised when Nick informed me. Don't fret, he reassured. Judge Potter dislikes cheaters and favors law enforcement. Kirsten thinks she's in control, but she's giving Nikki enough rope to hang herself. What do you mean? I inquired. Nikki likely won't show for counseling, he explained. Potter detests disobedience. He'll likely issue a bench warrant for her arrest. I'd like to witness that, I chuckled. I arrived promptly at the counselor's office, but Nikki was a no-show. The counselor, Judy McGregor, and I caught up instead, and she noted Nikki's absence for the judge. Later, Nick informed me Judge Potter was irate and issued a bench warrant for Nikki's arrest, valid for five years. We kept tabs on her ATM use, mostly in Long Beach, but also in San Francisco and San Diego. Meanwhile, I stumbled upon short videos featuring her. They all had a similar theme. In one, she had sex with two men while her husband was tied up, forced to watch. After, she rubbed her cum-covered self on his face, laughing. It sickened me to realize this was likely her intent for me. Our court date arrived. Kirsten was there but Nikki was absent, as expected. When it was our turn, Nick and I approached the bench, observing Kirsten alone at her table. Judge Potter wasn't pleased. Where's your client? he demanded. She's busy, Kirsten replied. Busy? Judge Potter scoffed. She's a porn actress. More important than her divorce? She couldn't make it, Kirsten insisted. Judge Potter sighed heavily. Fine. Another bench warrant and I'll rule on the divorce today, he declared. But your honor, we still have motions to present, Kirsten interjected. I've seen enough, counselor, the judge snapped, clearly irritated. He glanced at both sides before continuing. While there are guidelines for asset division, the court has significant discretion in this state, he explained. In my evaluation, I've considered both parties. On one hand, we have a decorated former police officer who risked his life protecting a grandmother. On the other, we have a woman, acknowledged by her attorney, as a drug-abusing porn actress who intentionally betrayed and abandoned her spouse for a debased lifestyle. Additionally, she's collaborating with one of the most notorious amateur pornographers in the industry. And it's concerning to learn, counselor, that you were involved in facilitating some of your client's activities. While it doesn't constitute an ethical breach, it's a cause for concern. 
I suggest exercising caution in the future. After reviewing all documents and the counselor's report, I find no option but to grant the plaintiff's divorce petition, he concluded, striking his gavel. Good luck, Mr. Carson, and thank you for your service. I glanced at Nick in disbelief. Did we win? I asked. He grinned, shaking my hand. We did, he confirmed. Congratulations, Ned. You're free now. Kirsten approached us, gathering her belongings. Congratulations, Ned, she said, offering her hand. You got what you wanted. I hope you're satisfied. I shook her hand, understanding her disappointment. No, I'm not satisfied, I replied. I haven't been for a while. I handed her a DVD from my briefcase. You once said if I had a message for Nikki to let you know. Here's my final message, I said. Feel free to watch it. I also have a cashier's check for a share of our account. I closed it yesterday. I'll pass it on, she murmured. What's on the DVD? Just a message, I replied, though it was more than that. The previous day, I set up a camera in the backyard, filling a drum with all of Nikki's belongings, her wedding dress, our photos, trinkets, and set it ablaze. Nikki, I began in the recording. I once loved you deeply. But seeing your actions, I can't forgive you. I hope you wake up one day. Goodbye. I left the camera to capture the final destruction, walking away. Life moved forward after Nikki. I revamped the house, erasing any trace of her presence. My counseling sessions with Rose continued, and I hit the gym regularly. I even adopted the diet we devised and bid farewell to cigarettes. A couple of months later, I checked my weight and found myself at 185 pounds, still a work in progress, but feeling better than in ages. Yet, the one thing missing was the companionship Nikki once provided. Then, fate intervened. While grocery shopping, I accidentally collided with a woman, Brenda Wilkins. Despite my apologies, she greeted me with a beautiful smile. We exchanged introductions, and I noticed no rings on her finger. After chatting, I surprisingly asked her to dinner, and she agreed. Brenda, a widowed doctor, had lost her husband and son in a tragic accident. I shared my divorce story and struggles with diabetes medications. She empathized, suggesting a visit to her office to review my meds. Her diagnosis shocked me, but her treatment plan worked wonders, complemented by my improved lifestyle. Our first night together felt like a rebirth, and for the first time in years, I felt at peace. Waking up to Brenda's smile, I knew she was the one. She tearfully accepted my proposal, and after our wedding, we started anew, selling our homes for a fresh start. A year later, Brenda gave birth to twins, Christopher and Julie. Parenthood brought joy to our home. A decade into our marriage, Kirsten appeared at our doorstep, looking worn out. She revealed Nikki's downfall, confirming my predictions about Ramon's exploitation. Nikki's tragic fate served as a reminder of the life I'd left behind. She was discovered unconscious in an alley and admitted to a rehab center. A few months ago, I found out and arranged for a transfer here. Unfortunately, she's battling cancer and her prognosis is grim, Kirsten explained. I thought you vowed she'd never reach such a state. What happened? I inquired. We lost contact about six years ago. Recently, authorities in Los Angeles reached out, and I flew there to see her. It's heartbreaking, Kirsten shared. That's saddening news. So, what do you need from us? I asked. She's seeking closure. Despite everything, she wants to see you one last time. I understand your feelings toward her and myself, but could you find it in your heart to grant her this final wish? Kirsten pleaded, a rare request from her. Glancing at Brenda, I saw empathy in her expression. What's your take on this, dear? I inquired. Kirsten's correct. She needs closure, and so do you. How severe is the cancer? Brenda inquired. It's advanced, spreading throughout her body. The doctors say it's too late for treatment. She could have only a few months or hours left, Kirsten answered. All right, I'll go see her, I consented. 
I'll accompany you, Brenda offered. With Carla available to babysit, Brenda and I followed Kirsten to the hospice. Upon entering Nikki's room, I was stunned. She appeared unrecognizable, frail, and surrounded by medical equipment. Tears welled in her eyes as she recognized me. Ned, she whispered, tears streaming down her face. Is it really you? You look so good. Yes, Nikki, it's me, I confirmed. Oh, Ned, I'm so sorry, she sobbed. I've messed up so much. I know you said you'd never forgive me, but please, forgive me. It hurts so much. Will you? Brenda's tearful expression mirrored my own struggle. Despite the pain, I knew what I had to do. Taking her hand, I reassured her. It's all right, Nikki. I forgive you, I uttered as she broke into sobs, clutching onto me. I held her close, allowing her to release her anguish. Moments later, a nurse administered medication to help her sleep. As she drifted off, I gently laid her back on her pillow. Thank you for coming, Kirsten expressed. You're welcome, I replied, nodding. How long will you stay? Until the end, she whispered. I've made all the arrangements. There won't be a memorial service. She didn't want one. What about Ramon? I inquired. Kirsten retrieved a newspaper clipping from her purse. After he replaced her, he brought in another girl, Kirsten disclosed. Her husband wasn't pleased and ended up killing him, quite brutally. I skimmed through the article. The disfigured remains of infamous pornographer Ramon Torres were discovered in an abandoned warehouse in Ontario Saturday morning, the article detailed. Disfigured? I queried Kirsten. Yes, she affirmed. Reportedly, his genitals were severed and placed in his mouth before he was beheaded. His limbs were severed and he was disemboweled. Harsh, I remarked. They're certain it was the husband? Yes, she confirmed. He was spotted leaving the warehouse with one of Ramon's limbs. The court acquitted him on grounds of temporary insanity. I can empathize, I admitted. I had similar thoughts myself. I'm sorry, Ned, Kirsten expressed. For everything. Yeah, I responded softly. On another note, we both felt remorse after watching that video you provided, she shared. I never fully grasped the pain of infidelity until then. Before, it was just about my own satisfaction. But after witnessing that, I had a change of heart. I never realized the depth of hurt caused by betrayal, nor its financial toll, she added, glancing at Nikki. Thanks to you, I've evolved from the person I was a decade ago. I'm glad to hear that, Kirsten, I acknowledged. Take care, Ned, she embraced me. And look after my former brother-in-law, she directed to Brenda, hugging her. Will do, Brenda assured, reciprocating the hug. We departed and returned to the car. You okay? Brenda inquired as we fastened our seat belts. Yeah, I'm all right, I replied, starting the car. Karma, it can be quite the reckoning, I ruminated as we drove home. Write your opinion in the comments. Thanks for watching and have a great day.